Shields up, Ironbreakers. Welcome back to Grand Blue Fantasy Relink. Now that we finally had a chance to get some hands on with the game, I figured this would be a good time to do an overview of the gameplay mechanics with an emphasis on combat and progression. I've already done my initial impressions video where I go over things like visuals, art style, and overall feel of the combat. So if you're curious about that, be sure to check out my previous video for a more in-depth look at those elements. Now for a quick summary, I really enjoyed the demo, I've played it for about 20 hours at this point, because I wanted to try out different characters, experiment with the sigil system, different party compositions, and get max rating on all of the missions available to see if it would unlock any additional content. Spoiler alert, it didn't. However, there is some additional content you might have missed in story mode in the form of the Omen Stones. These unlock after you complete the first section, which is constitutes of saving the villagers, after which you'll be given a prompt asking if you wish to proceed to the rescue of the remaining villagers or stay in the area. If you choose to stay in the area, you'll be able to take on the Omen Stone challenges, which summon much harder enemies for you to fight. There's two of them, as you all pointed out in my previous video since I missed the one near the Windmill Village, so thanks for mentioning it. This is just something to do if you need an excuse to jump back into the demo since we still have about two weeks before we can play the real deal. But anyway, like I mentioned, in this video I want to go over the gameplay mechanics we got to experience for those of you that don't have access to the demo. But even if you do have access to the demo, I'd appreciate your input in the comment section in case you feel I missed a critical mechanic or if you learned anything new. And while you're down there, you might notice there's a like button. Doesn't it look so lonely down there? Give it a good smack for luck, okay? Thanks. So let's get started with the basics. Every character can dodge and block, which are done with the right trigger and left bumper button respectively. I tell you the keyboard bindings, but we haven't really seen the PC version just yet. Dodging at the last second will provide you with a few seconds of invulnerability, but I haven't really seen any benefit to last second blocking. Although this might be something that is further explored within the mastery tree in the retail version of the game. Same thing for perfect dodging, really. Right now we get a few seconds of invulnerability, sure, but maybe in the final product certain characters can get additional benefits through their respective mastery trees. In the demo we also get a glimpse into consumables. There's four of them, and they get replenished whenever you rest at a hollowed ground, the green crystals. Each of the items is linked to a press on the directional pad, so up D-pad is a basic healing potion, left D-pad is a full health potion, right D-pad is a party heal potion, and down D-pad is a resurrection potion if you go into critical state. I suspect as we advance in the game we might unlock additional consumables or maybe increase the quantity of potions that were available in the demo somehow, but at this point this is just speculation. Although since I just brought up Critical State, let's talk about that. Critical State is what happens when a character's hit points reach zero. While in Critical State your movement is very slow and you can't participate in combat. You can just drag yourself across the battlefield. At this point, your options are to wait for someone else to come and pick you up, or use the resurrection potions I mentioned earlier. Getting into critical state can be problematic if you're shooting for a high score during missions, as there can be conditions that punish you for going into critical state, which in turn will also negatively affect your rewards, so keep that in mind. Now getting back to combat, each character has basic attacks and their character ability, which are mapped to square and triangle respectively. Basic attacks are used as part of the character specific combo strings, charged attacks or timed attacks, so be sure to check your character sheet to understand how they work. The character ability changes based on the character specific mechanics. For instance, with Gran it's kind of a combo finisher, and I say kinda because it usually has more than one input and it can also be used as a charge attack. With Charlotta however, it is both a parry and an aerial gap closer. With Narmaya, it's a stance changer. With Zeta, it's a parry and counter move. With Rackham, it's a charged attack that's linked to his heat gauge, and the other characters will have their own mechanics as well. The main takeaway here is, depending on the character you're playing with, you will get a different gameplay experience, which brings with it some much needed variety. Beyond their basic kit, each character will also be able to equip 4 active skills. In the demo we are given 5 to choose from, but in the final game we will unlock quite a few more through the mastery skill tree. These skills can be special attacks, self and party buffs, healing skills and who knows what else. These will dictate what playstyle you're going for and choosing the right skills for the mission you're tackling is going to play an important role. 
Next up, I want to talk about link attacks. These are performed with the circle button whenever you manage to break a monster's stun gauge. As you perform link attacks, you will fill your link percentage. Once it reaches 100% and every character has performed a link attack, you'll be able to enter link time the next time you perform a link attack. Try saying that five times fast, because I know I sure as hell messed it up. Anyway, during link time, your party will have increased attack, increased critical hit rate, lower skill cooldown, health regen, and enemies will be slowed. This is your time to burst. Certain characters will also gain additional benefits during link time. For instance, I noticed that Rackham has maximum heat gauge during link times. I'm not sure if this is an unintended effect of the time slow mechanic or if it's just a part of link time buffs, but I would ask if any of you noticed similar effects with other characters. Next up, we have Skybound Arts. Below every character's hit points, you'll find an orange gauge that fills up the more you engage in combat. When that gauge is full, you'll be able to perform a special move. However, you'll want to be sure you sync it up with your party for maximum benefit, as you can chain Skybound Arts for a decent chunk of damage. If the whole party uses their Skybound Art, you'll get an additional burst of damage at the end called Full Burst. However, this can also be done with just two or three characters for small smaller burst of damage if you so choose. In fact, my S++ clear of the rock golem, my team went with two bursts, meaning we had two characters use their skybound art, and after the chain burst, the remaining two used their arts. This wasn't really planned, and at this point, I'm not 100% clear which is the better strategy, but hey, we cleared it with S++, so I'm not really complaining. Now an important thing to bring up about Skybound Arts is that they are elemental attacks, and there are elemental weaknesses in this game. This is clearly marked on the enemies you are fighting on the left of their health gauge. It always shows their weakness. If it is green, they are weak to wind, red, they are weak to fire, blue, weak to ice, brown, weak to earth, yellow, weak to light, and purple, weak to dark. Each character has their own elemental affinity, which you can clearly see in the party selection screen. For instance, Gran is wind, Rackham is fire, Charlotte is light, Catalina is ice, and so on. So an important aspect of Skybound Arts usage is that the initiator of the chain, which is to say the first person to cast their Skybound Art, determines the element of the final burst of damage. So if you really want to optimize damage in certain enemies, you'll want the character that has the element that the enemy is weak to to initiate the Skybound Art's chain. And there are ways to control this in the game, like for instance, you can basically tell your AI party to only use their arts after you initiate, and then you can take control of the character that has the best element for the fight. There's also sigils which allow characters to charge their skybound arts faster, so you can use those to ensure certain characters get their art ready faster, and then rely on the AI to use it, but naturally this is going to involve a certain element of chance, if it works like it did in the demo. Also, in case you don't know what sigils are, I'll touch up on those in just a minute. Now that we've talked about most of the general combat mechanics, because character specifics would be way too long for this video, let's talk a little about progression. This is something we didn't really get to experience in the demo due to its intentionally limited nature, but it was shown to us in the second showcase, so let's get started by talking about the mastery tree. This is a progression system, so as your character levels up, you're going to be gaining a currency called MSP, which I assume stands for Mastery Skill Points. This is the currency that you're going to use to unlock new nodes in the Mastery Tree. According to the developers in the showcase, you'll eventually be able to unlock everything in the tree, so you're free to choose whatever looks cool during the leveling process. The Mastery Skill Tree is divided into three categories, Offense, Defense, and Weapons. The nodes will provide you with passive bonuses, new active skills, and some of the nodes even change your character's base kit. Translating one of the skills they highlighted during the showcase revealed a node that allows Grant's charged attack to be used as a parry against enemy attacks. I'd also expect some nodes dedicated to perfect dodge and block, as I mentioned previously. Weapons play an interesting role in Grand Blue Fantasy Relink. As you would expect, you'll be able to both craft and upgrade them as you play the game. What you might not be expecting is that weapons come with their own mastery nodes in the weapon section of the mastery skill tree. 
You see, every time you craft a weapon, it opens up a new path in the tree, which gradually unlocks new nodes as you upgrade said weapon. These nodes are passive bonuses which are active even when the weapon isn't equipped, which means if you really like a character, there's an incentive for you to essentially craft and upgrade all of its weapons. Let's just hope that the grind is enjoyable. A cool feature they also showed when upgrading weapons was the wishlist functionality, which allows you to tag the materials and then filter available quests based on the material you need. I always appreciate features like this that allow players to find the information they need on the game itself without needing to resort to third-party websites. Beyond the new mastery nodes, if the demo weapons are anything to go by, you can also expect additional stats for when the weapon is equipped. Things like additional stun, crit chance, attack up, hit points, and more. I also noticed that these can stack with sigil skills. So if your weapon adds 2 points in the crit chance and then you equip a sigil with 3 points of crit chance, you end up with 5 points, which I believe translates to a 12% crit chance bonus. And now I hear you ask, sigils? What sigils? You see, in Grand Blue Fantasy Relink, you don't really craft armor. You craft weapons and then you can equip sigils in your character for further customization, but it basically works kind of like Monster Hunter armor. Each sigil gives you points in a passive skill like attack up, crit rating, stun power, hit points, and more. Now, in the demo, we could equip up the three sigils in our level 10 characters. However, in the showcase, we got to see level 100 characters, which were able to equip up the 10 sigils. Sigils will be acquired as quest rewards, but there's also an NPC that lets you trade for them. So fundamentally, in the final game, you will be able to make builds that allow you to play the same character in very different ways. Your build will be a choice of four skills out of however many skills each character will end up having, a weapon, and a set of ten or more sigils. And that's all the gameplay mechanics and progression that I've seen so far. I believe the game is looking pretty good. It's all a matter of how much content we'll have in the final product and how enjoyable it will be once we finish the story and progress into the endgame loop. I'm also very curious as to how grindy it is going to be to unlock each of the characters, as that is going to dictate what playstyles you have available to you at any given moment. Personally, I'm pretty hyped about the game. I think it'll be a good time. But if you're on the fence, I'd recommend waiting for more information. I'll be playing it here on the channel and I'll report back once I get to sink my teeth into some more content. Anyway, that's going to be it for now. If you enjoyed the video and found it informative, do hit the like button as it helps me out immensely. And while you're down there, feel free to subscribe and hit the bell notification icon if you like my content. As always, stay strong, stay safe, peace out.